Welcome to the first episode of Carpet Cliff Notes. Think of this like the condensed version of NPR. You know, sometimes we go two, sometimes three hours on that show uh, because we like the conversation to go deep and really hit on some details. But with this series, we're going to be, we are going to bring the highlights of Carpet Pythons to you in a more condensed version. Uh, we'll cover things like the complex itself, you know, a species breakdown. Um, hopefully we can try to educate people on the complex that sometimes it can be confusing. Uh, we'll go species by species, subspecies, all through it, natural history, all that kind of stuff. Um, history in the hobby. Uh, just, you know, different bloodlines, individual animals, breeders, all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously the morphs, uh, we'll hit on the good and the bad. Um, we'll give you some tips for keeping. Um, and of course we'll, we'll hit on little tips for breeding. Um, just little snippets of info that, uh, we've learned over the years, um, and, uh, try to uh, share that with you guys. Um, and <clears throat> we're going to highlight the breeders of, uh, carpet pythons, uh, all around the world. The goal is to highlight, you know, this amazing group of snakes and share, with you, the listeners, why we love them so much. So look forward to that. And obviously another thing that's near and dear to my heart is localities. Now that I've traveled to Australia two times and hope to keep going back and back, uh, the goal is to just, uh, you know, try to find as many of these different locality of carpets uh, in the wild and see how does that, uh, you know, equate to what we're doing in the hobby. Um, you know, <clears throat> bring back some of the some of that info, that data of what's going on in, in the environment to find out, are we keeping them correctly? Are, is, is everything that we were providing, uh, you know, carbon pythons exactly what they need to, to not only survive in captivity, but to thrive in captivity. <laughs> All right, let's start at the beginning. All right. So what is the carpet python complex made up of? So real quick, let's talk about the taxonomy part of it. Taxonomy can be fluid, and what was true, you know, 10 years ago may have changed today. Uh, we see that a lot. Um, it seems that the more and more advances that are made in the field the closer that we get to understanding the relationship between different taxa. So what is true today, right now, 2020, may be totally different five years from now. C currently, there is work being done with carpet pythons to try to really understand what is going on with them. There, there has been debate for years and years and years subspecies, species, you know, uh, races, um, localities. Um, but basically what we see today, as of right now, January of 2020, the carpet complex um, has six subspecies and two full species. The Popwin carpet, which is the only carpet python that is known that is outside of Australia, that is Morelia spilota harrisoni, you have the diamond python, which is Morelia spilota spilota. The coastal carpet python, which is Morelia spilota mcdowelli. The jungle carpet, which is Morelia spilota chenii. The inland carpet python, which is Morelia spilota mcafi. And the Darwin carpet python, which is Morelia spilota variegata. The two full species are first the southwestern carpet python, which is Morelia imbricata, which is on the west coast of Australia. And then you have Morelia breadli, or the centralium python. Most people in the hobby just refer to them as breadli. So that's the basic overview as of right now of what the carpet python complex is entails. In this episode, we're going to talk about 
right from the gate, some of the misconceptions about carpet pythons and just put those to bed so we can move on to better things. Um, I would say that the first thing that I hear most about carpet pythons that they're aggressive. I think they get this rap because as babies, they tend to be nippy. Um, but if you've been bit by a baby carpet python, you know uh, that there's really nothing to it. Um, I've worked with many different species of pythons and have been bitten by more royal pythons than I have carpet pythons. But this doesn't mean that, you know, carpets are better than royal pythons. But if you decide to keep pythons as pets, chances are that at some point you're going to get bit. Um, an adult carpet python is a medium-sized python, so their bite is not all that bad. But, you know, from an adult uh, depending on which subspecies you're working with and the size, um, you know, some of them can pack a punch. Um, but I would say that I, I have a collection of over 200 plus carpet pythons and have worked with, you know, 30, 32 different species of pythons throughout my life. And I can say that for the most part, 99% of the time that the adults just relax when they're older. Once they're big enough that they know that you're not a threat, they seem to calm down. Um, and, and, and they do this pretty quickly. And if you work with them, you know, I, I think that you will see that, uh, that they can be really, really chill snakes. Now, that, you know, the thing that people often forget is that, like people, snakes can be individuals and i have a few that are just not happy to be picked up um to be messed with and they just want to be left alone the 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 other thing that i think sometimes gives carpet pythons the bad rap is the fact that they are very food aggressive uh, they have a very strong feeding response and sometimes it can be ma mistaken for them being aggressive uh, but one trick that uh, I have done to avoid being bitten in a feeding response uh, is to use a snake hook. Um, I simply open the tub or cage and tap them with the hook, and they snap right out of that feeding response, and then I reach in and grab them. When I feed them, I do not use the hook. I use hemostats, uh, open their enclosure, and offer them prey. They grab it. I release the prey, close the enclosure, and move on to the next snake. What I have found is that they understand that, you know, if I open up a cage and they're ready to go, that simple tap will chill them out. Um, and I have found that works with not just carpet pythons, but for uh, quite a number of species of pythons. Um, so to take all of that, uh, carpet pythons are not these evil creatures that people make them out to be. Um, you know, they are, I would say, I mean, they're pretty relaxed as adults, in my opinion, in my experience. Myth number two, carpet pythons get big. You know, carpet pythons do not get as big as most people think. They fall, for me, I think they fall into that perfect size um, python. They're big enough to sort of be impressive looking and give you the python feel, but they're not too big to where they become difficult to work with or that caging becomes a problem. Um, you know, carpets average, I would say that the average length of a carpet is probably six feet. Um, depending on subspecies, uh, you're going to get some bigger. Individuals will be bigger. Um, the largest of the carpets is the coastal carpet, Morelia Spilota McDowell. And the confusion with the difference between what you see in the wild or even in Australia, as opposed to what you see here in the U.S. in collections, is that the coastal carpets that range um, in this, that are in the southern part of their range, tend to be the ones that grow to those big sizes. 
Um, most of the coastal carpets out in outside of Australia are from the northern range of where the carpets, uh, coastal carpet comes from. And they seem to stay on the smaller side for a coastal carpet. Um, that being said, there are some big coastal carpet pythons. And I would say probably the one that leans itself towards being the biggest of the complex is probably bread lie. Um, you're looking at, I would say, an average of seven to eight feet um, easily. Um, you know, you're talking six foot size cage, um, you know, uh, whereas most carpet pythons outside of the bread lie can be kept um, in, you know, four foot cages. Myth number three would be carpets dull with age. Um, well, carpet pythons are kind of the ugly ducklings of the python world. They start as these dull gray, um, you know, some of them are red, but most um, are this gray, um, uh, black color. And uh, I can tell you <laughs> from experience that it's a hard sell at a show because nobody wants to believe that that gray black snake is going to turn into this beautiful yellow and black jungle carpet uh, as an adult. Um, but yeah, they they you they they do the opposite of what you'll see with royal pythons. So royal pythons coming out of the egg look their best. I mean they are. They are really phenomenal looking snakes. But you'll see as they mature, royal pythons tend to uh, lose their luster, if you will. Whereas carpet pythons do the opposite. They sort of, you know, uh, as they age, that color comes in and they really, you know, they go through that ontogenic color change and they really like, you know, become an amazing, uh, amazing snake. Uh, and it's cool to watch that change. Um, I think that the coolest thing about carpets just in general is the variety. I mean, there are so many colors and patterns and every time you hatch a clutch, there's one of them in the clutch that is going to be, especially with coastal carpets, one of them is going to be one of the oddballs, you know, one of the crazy pattern one or crazy color one or, you know, and, and that's sort of how like these selective breeding projects work. And that's how you got to the yellow and black, you know, screaming jungle carpets that you see today. Myth number four is that carpet pythons need high humidity. Um, so humidity is one of those things um, it gets thrown around and I, I, I would, you know, after being in Australia and being in the environment, it is, it is quite humid, but, um, carpet pythons need hydration more than they need humidity. In my opinion, um, by giving the snake fresh water, at least once, a, at least once a week, you will keep your carpet healthy and happy. I've never had any major issues with shedding with carpets. Um, I've been in so many different situations with carpet pythons. I've kept carpet pythons. I've had a carpet python in my, you know, as a pet or uh, one in, I think I started in 2002 uh, with my first. And I, it wasn't until 2008 that I started to sort of look at things as trying to be a breeder. Um, and breed carpet pythons. But that time in between, I was moving around, you know, I was a young guy and I moved from, you know, apartment to apartment, situation to situation. And, and that whole time taking those, that pair of well, what I thought was a pair, and we'll get into that later, but taking those carpets from place to place, never had an issue with, with uh, shedding at all. So it's not like they need that high humidity to shed. I find that, again, I hate to keep comparing carpet pythons to royal pythons, but um, royal pythons are, are the most popular of the pythons. I mean, hands down, they are the you know uh, most popular, uh, I, I don't even know if you would say pet snake, but um, they are the most popular. Um, Everybody has seen, I mean, you go to shows, they're all over the place. I've had more trouble with having royal pythons shed out 
um, if the humidity is off than I've had with carpet pythons. That being said, when I was over in uh, Australia, um, you're looking at like when I saw gelatin jungles, the, you know, the humidity was in, you know, like maybe 70 so percent. I don't think that it's necessarily, you know, uh, my approach with humidity is this. I live in the northeast of uh, the United States. And during the winter, we're running heat in the houses and it, it's dry heat. And what I do to offset that is I just run a humidifier in my room and I have no issues um, with that at all. So um, the one thing I will say, again, I go back to that hydration, just keeping them hydrated and, and constantly giving them fresh water. I, I've seen this with most Morelia, carpets, scrub, well, scrub's not Morelia anymore, but carpets, green trees, um, that they will always drink from a fresh water bowl. Um, and who would want to drink from a from a from a water bowl that's been sitting there for days. But as soon as you put that fresh water in, nine times out of 10, that snake's coming right to that water bowl and they're gonna drink. So they don't need any special requirements as far as humidity goes. The other, the last one that I'm gonna hit on is gonna be uh, that they are difficult to switch uh, prey items from mice to rats or you know um, that they're picky. Um, you know, some can be tricky as babies, but once you get them started, my carpets never refuse a meal. Never. I have diamond pythons that will eat uh, if I offered them, um, you know, a rat that they would eat it at 60 degrees without without even thinking about it. Um, as long as they're provided uh, a basking spot during the day, um, there's no issues. Um, so I've never had a problem with switching um, from, uh, you know, prey items around. I think variety is good. I think that uh, helps um, uh, helps me feel <laughs> feel better about it. I, I don't know if they, if they care. Maybe they they don't care. But um, you know, uh, I try to mix it up between rodents and birds, and and try to get that mix going that way. So what is it about carpet pythons that I love so much and why do I want to take you on this journey with me to discover why they are so cool? It's because, uh, I mean, to me, they're just the perfect python. I mean, they don't get too big. They're a manageable size. They like to perch. They're out in their cages. You can observe them and see what they do and, and have that little piece of the wild in your, in your home. Um, you know, they come in so many different colors and patterns. There's, you know, the, the perfect selective breeding project for uh, as far as pythons go, in my opinion. Um, you know, there's so many different varieties and colors and patterns, and there's subspecies, and there's all these different morphs now, and there's localities. There's just, it goes on and on and on and on. But to me, they are, again, like I said, they're just the perfect pet python. So if, if you've been sort of confused about carpet pythons or or don't know where to start uh, I would recommend you know going and 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 spending your time researching and and going on you know groups like Morelia pick of the week on Facebook get the complete carpet python you know these are, are great spots to start go back and listen to our you know our whole back catalog on Morelia Python radio of I mean I would say that we have some of the best keepers and breeders of carpet pythons have been on that show over the years and you can just get so much knowledge from that show these little segments will hopefully you know kind of cut it down and, and spark that interest for people that you know are on the fence about carpet pythons and you know I, I just you know after seeing them in the wild there's so much more that I want to do with with this uh, family of snakes. I, I I just can't tell you how excited I get. I've I've worked with so many different species of pythons over the years, and always and every time I come back to carpet pythons. And besides that, this the awesome snake that that is that they are. It's the community. The community is a great group of people, and yes, we are passionate about it. We have our own uh, ideas of, of, of carpet python and the carpet python complex, but at the end of the day, you know, we can respect 
and we can, you know, put those feelings aside and, and be able to uh, live, you know, together in, the, in this reptile hobby. So if you're even remotely curious about them, just dive in. I promise you, once you get one, you will not stop. Thanks for listening. I hope that this has taught you uh, a, a little bit about the Carpet Python Complex. And I look forward to doing another episode in the near future to try to educate people about carpet pythons and the Carpet Python Complex. 